Welcome everyone to the seventh annual Flash Fiction Night on this fine quasi-spring evening here at the Hoover Puck Library. My name is Anthony Vaca, and besides being a librarian at this wonderful temple of knowledge right above our heads, I also do my best to lead Wright Club, which, uh, which the Hoover Public Library also sponsors. For those who are not exactly sure what a Wright Club is, allow me to explain in brief. Wright Club is a monthly support group for writers of all stripes, be you poet, novelist, playwright, memoirist, all are welcome. And what you are welcome to is an environment fostering creativity, a commune of like-minded individuals that meets one Saturday a month at this library to share from their current endeavors and receive feedback from their peers in an open, friendly forum. Future dates for those meetings can be found on the handouts in the lobby, as well as a sign-up sheet for emails about all of our future events. All you have to do is legibly put down your email, and I can't stress legibly enough. <laughs> now, before we get this show on the road, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend this evening, showing your support for your friends or family members who may be, may be presenting tonight, but also for your support for the world of art. There is really no better cause in the world than the bolstering of humanity's creative endeavors, no matter how small the gesture may seem. Tonight, as you are all aware, we are celebrating the written word. For as the venerated American novelist William Gass once wrote, the true alchemists do not change lead into gold, they change the world into words. And without further ado, allow me to introduce our first writer tonight, Carol Wilde. Now, Carol Wilde has uh, attended Ramsey High School. She was a school newspaper editor and also had a side gig writing about Ramsey events in a regular column for the local newspaper, The Shades Valley Sun. She continued writing journalism in Auburn for the Plainsman and also claims to have shown a real knack for archery in college, but never kept up with her bow and arrow skills. Last summer, she enjoyed being a storyteller for the Association of Related Churches. So without further ado, let's welcome Carol Wallace to the stage. Good evening. I used to be so naive. Before I worked as an enumerator in the 2010 census, prior to that job, I thought, number one, everyone trusts our government. Number two, the only reason an employer suggests wearing tennis shoes is to stay comfy while working on the clock. Ooh, not entirely true, either belief. I believed every day working part-time as a census rep would be a simple way to make a good extra paycheck and a chance to meet new people on the job other than the usual office crew. Oh my God, that last assumption, only too true. After having dodged two lawn furniture tables successfully, I must inform you that there's a good amount of US citizens who distrust any federal agency, even ones that don't wanna take your hard earned money. And tennis shoes are for running, like winged mercury, to save your bones from the local neighborhood fast-running, teeth-bearing hounds of hell. The census will never ask you to drive to interviews where you feel there is danger. What will happen is that you'll get assigned to areas off one GPS grid and away from cell phone towers, areas that will cause you to pray to God, Buddha, Confucius, whoever's on call that day, should you cave in and say that the assignment includes people who you swear came straight out of a horror flick? Uh, two college boys, uh, let's just call them Larry and Tom, will hastily raise their hands to volunteer for your assignment. At the next census meeting, Larry and Tom will imply that your Frankenstein psychos were incredibly nice that they answered the interview two more times, and they even exchanged Christmas card information. I, I would not allow Larry and Tom to make a fool of my work. I, I, my reassignment number was zero up until today. Uh, who would live on a gravel road like this that wound in circles around a hill like a cobra about to strike in the darkest woods ever. Then signs started, painted in red, a uh, blood red, coincidentally. No trespassing, another sign, stay out, this means you. 
After 10 signs, I began to think, <laughs> okay, Larry and Tom, I give, but no, turn around. There was no shoulder against the narrow road from which to pull off. I would have ended up in a gulch in the dark woods, harboring strained hopes that Mr. Friendly Sign Maker would assist. A oh, fat chance. I was forced to drive to the end of the road to Mount St. Outer Limits, somewhere in Alabama. Words echoed in my mind. The census worker's body was never located. After ignoring 10 no trespassing signs, the census has stated Carol Wilde was not their brightest employee, but definitely devoted. I eased out of my Honda to take a long, uncomfortable look at this desolate spot. There's a gray 1930s dilapidated farm home in the distance with a tin roof. A middle-aged, heavy-set man wearing dickies is in the front yard, and he's alone. He's using a chainsaw to cut what seemed to be an endless supply of randomly shaped wood pieces. Oh, no. Stacks of freshly cut wood everywhere, smells of pine, nothing completed. <clears throat> I say, getting his attention from the sawing, I present my ID badge and I ask for a brief interview, please. Mr. Lumberjack stops the saw, walks over. He looks confused but guarded. What is your name, sir? Luke, is his reply. Luke removes his work goggles and begins talking. I'm busy, Carol, but I always have time to help the FBI. I correct, U.S. Census, uh, not FBI. Luke smiles and, and smiles at me, keeps talking. Sure, Carol. Uh, I start again, who owns the home? I begin the census questions. Mama, Luke answers. And what is Mama's legal name, I ask? Uh, Mama, just put Mama and Adley. Dog, God and Jesus. He continues, who's Lee, I ask? Me, you need to race that Luke guy, Carol. He's bad blood. Okay, this man's amazingly dumb or straight from Alfred Hitchcock's list of most memorable killers. Luke, now Lee, noticed I'd only written his name. I'll put Mama down too, Carol. Uh, is Mama alive, I ask? Luke Lee shrugs, uh, does it matter? Wish I'd won my Nikes up here. Reeboks are too worn to gather speed to try Nadia Komenich backwards flip into the Honda. Lee, obsessed with looking at my clipboard, pointing out, add dog. Okay, Lee, I'll add anybody you want if you don't buzzsaw me to death. Carol, how could you forget about God and Jesus? Luke Lee admonishes me, his voice raises. Frighteningly, he is now fingering his saw switch. Oh, no, he's becoming itchy to saw something, something like me. All right, God, Jesus, last block on the form. Luke Lee says to put dog in the ethnic category as non-Hispanic, include mama as angel, that's a new census race there, Luke Lee is now running the show. His, his breath is strange up close. Whatever he's eating or drinking, it's not on any school lunch menu. Inching closer than I prefer, he orders me to put God as other and Jesus as Eskimo. Luke Lee said he pictures our states, uh, he pictures Jesus as an Eskimo because Eskimos live in clouds. Besides, somebody ought to vouch for all our state's underappreciated Eskimo population. I inch towards my car, backwards. I thank Luke for his interview. Interview over. It's way over. Hey, Carol, you didn't ask me about my ethnic background. I crank the Honda and smile. I, I wave, drive away like I don't hear him. Carol, put me down as alien. While speeding amidst churning gravel pieces flying everywhere, I said it out loud, Luke, I could not agree with you more. I can't wait to work for the 2020 census, but keeping an eye out for alien Eskimo angels, uh, no longer naive, I am prepared.
Our next presenter this evening is, is uh, a regular here at our right club, Phil Fisherman. He, uh, Phil Fisherman was a U.S. Army officer in the chemical corps where he was an intelligence officer, where he also studied chemistry at IU. Um, he's had a long career of sales and management and now is retired, but he, since then, or actually he might have been working on it beforehand too, he has published two books which both can be found in the library. One is called A Teacher's Got to Dance, and the other one is A Really Inconvenient Truth. Tonight, he'll be reading a chapter from his work and project, Progress. Um, it's a novel called Succession, A Republic Reborn. Now, to set the stage, the year is 2093, and it's in Texas, Arizona, and Ala Texas, Arizona, and Alaska have succeeded. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Anthony. It's, it's 2043. <laughs> My writing's not that good. But anyway, thanks all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a chapter uh, titled Arizona. As his boss, Governor Richard Houston of Texas, had suggested, Jerry Collins put in a call to his old high school sweetheart, Florence Zimmerman, who was now governor of Arizona. They had gone on to find other loves, but had gotten back in touch at their 20-year high school reunion in Scottsdale 12 years ago, and found after all those years, they still had a lot of interests in common, including politics. They were both strong conservatives, although Zimmerman tended more to the libertarian side. They both were avid and accomplished athletes, having lettered in sports in high school and going on to varsity sports in college. Collins had been the starting quarterback for the Arizona State champion, Goldwater Tigers, and his school's leading golfer in his senior year. At only five feet, eight inches, and 170, 170 pounds, he knew he was way too small for major collegiate football, but he did win a substantial scholarship to the University of Texas in golf. Until he arrived in Austin, he had envisioned himself as a winner on the PGA circuit, but those dreams quickly vanished when he started playing with other members of his team. He was an excellent golfer, but so were his teammates and players at competing schools. Compared to them, he was just an average golfer, so he realized he had better apply himself in academics if he was ever able to achieve any success in life. Fortunately, he was sharp mentally and enjoyed learning so that when he focused on his studies, he did quite well. He could have done even better, but there was the social life to attend to. He and Florence had been in love, or at least thought they were, but Florence's parents put an end to the budding romance. Not that her parents were all that religious, but they were determined that their only daughter not marry out of the faith. When Collins headed off to Texas, Florence was devastated, but her parents were delighted. Florence was every bit the athlete that Jerry was, earning letters in swimming and diving for all four years of high school. She was a very proficient swimmer, but her forte was diving. And her favorite was the swan dive, which hit, fit her physique perfectly. At five feet, nine inches, one inch taller than her boyfriend, and a classic model figure, her execution of the dive was every bit as graceful as the swan it was named for. Her plain face and oversized nose prevented her from being considered beautiful, but they were more than made up for by her winning smile and personality. In addition to her athletic prowess, she was no slouch in the classroom. Even with all the time in the pool and on the diving boards, student council and a very active social life, she was able to maintain a 3.8 average. Based on her grade point average, ACT score, numerous activities and aquatic skills, she had full paid scholarship offers from no less than eight prestigious universities, but opted to stay close to home at her mother's alma mater, the University of Arizona in Tucson. 
Given her athletic and academic credentials, she was sought after by a number of sororities, but her parents wanted her to be in a Jewish sorority so that she would meet and marry a nice and well-connected Jewish boy. Following her parents' wishes, she joined her mother's sorority, Sigma Delta Tau. As her parents hoped and predicted, she met and dated a number of Jewish students, and in her sophomore year met the fellow who she would marry a few years later, Josh Zimmerman. He was four years her senior and a second year law student. He definitely fit the profile Florence's parents had hoped for. His father was the senior partner in a prestigious Phoenix law firm, and his mother a professor of creative writing at nearby Wilkes College. Josh was an only child and slightly introverted, but the other qualifiers were in place. He was bright and Jewish. Florence apparently had her sights set on politics as she had majored in government and minored in public speaking. After graduation, she interned for a congressman for a while and then returned home to run for Phoenix City Council when she was only 25 with Josh, her new husband, as campaign manager. She narrowly lost, but she and Josh learned enough in the process that two years later she won with 70% of the vote. She was a strong proponent of smaller government and lower taxes and was consistent in her voting on those issues. In fact, her constituents learned early that when she promised something in her campaign, she delivered. She didn't always get her way, but there was never any question where she stood. She was elected mayor when she was only 31 and dealt skillfully and decisively with the riots of 2026. She could easily have won re-election as mayor, but opted to run for Congress and won handily. She and Josh briefly discussed moving to Washington, but Josh was firmly established in his father's law firm, and a move would mean starting over. They agreed that Florence would fly home on weekends when Congress was in session, which she did initially. But as time passed, the flights home became spaced further apart due to the hassle of flying and the time apart began taking its toll on the marriage. Florence caught wind of rumors regarding her husband's philandering, and it wasn't long before she started getting even. When she advocated for term limits and stepped down after two terms as a congresswoman, nobody was surprised, but it made it that much easier for her to beat a long, entrenched, and shady senator the next election. Now governor at 50, she was still swimming, although she had given up her diving several years ago. She had maintained that schoolgirl figure and looked closer to 30 than 50. Hi, Jer. I'd been meaning to call you, but as you can imagine, I've been a little tied up. Collins chuckled. Yeah, Flo, just a little. Seriously, Houston and I are well aware of your share of domestic problems, but he thought, and I agree, that it would behoove us to start doing some joint planning for various scenarios. The governor's office receives large volumes of mail, mostly inconsequential, but even the least of these requires some sort of polite response. Her secretary was quite proficient at handling all but the more sensitive issues, and this freed up Governor Zimmerman for the more important issues of the day. On this Thursday, a letter to the governor with no postage arrived, which was marked personal in large capital letters, and the secretary came in placed it on Zimmerman's desk, and left the room. Zimmerman called back to her secretary. Sheila, this letter has no postage. Did it come through the mail? No, Governor. Brad, my assistant, brought it to me and said that it was at the top of his end basket when he had gotten back from a trip to the restroom. She opened the letter and began reading. Hello, Governor. You probably don't remember me, but I sure remember you. Let me refresh your memory. It was a dreary Wednesday night 13 years ago in a small out of the way suburb of Washington where we met. It was a honky tonk kind of bar with loud country music. I bought you a drink at the bar and after a dance, we sat down at a table, had a few more drinks and then left the place for a nearby motel. You told me your name was something like Mary Smith, but I remember at the time figuring that you had made that up Made, made that name up 
because you sure didn't act like any Mary Smith I ever knew at the bar or in the motel room that night. My name, by the way, is Rex Morgan. Not that you might recall, but I think it best that we get to know one another a little bit more. As she read, she tried to recall. 13 years ago, the time was right, but how could it be? There'd been a few, but probably no more than five or six, and she'd been extra careful. Always a different bar in a different town where nobody knew her or would even recognize her. In each case, she would take the additional precaution of parking in a different place and taking a taxi to the designated spot for the evening. Pardon me. In retrospect, you might have been better advised to use a pseudonym like Dolores McCutcheon or Agnes Weyerhaeuser, which would not have been so obvious. I do compliment you, however. You definitely made the chase difficult, which made it all the more exhilarating. In any event, I want to congratulate you. You've made a real name for yourself, and I certainly have no intention of hurting you or your career. All contraire, I want to be your friend. Ha, I will bet, I'll bet that you had no idea I or one of your other one-nighters even know how to spell au contraire, let alone know the meaning. You see, I too am a pretty educated person with degrees in philosophy and psychology. Where in hell is he going with this, she thought. She wanted to stop reading and shred the letter, but resisted the impulse and continued to read. Unfortunately, I have a bit of a problem and am reaching out to you as a friend to help me out. As smart as I am, I made a huge mistake in getting involved with a gambling syndicate controlled by the mafia. I want out, but they have threatened to kill me. I need $10,000 to pay them off and another $10,000 to get out of the country and restart my life. I assure you that I will repay your generosity by never asking for another dime and never trying to contact you again. You can let me know by email within 24 hours at rexalonglostfriend at gmail.com. Just write OK, and I will be back in touch to tell you where to wire the funds. With deepest regards, Rex. Zimmerman started to shred the letter and paused. What if I don't respond, she thought. She copied the email address and shredded the letter. For the next hour, she was unable to get her mind off the letter. She told her secretary that she was feeling ill and was taking the afternoon off. I'm sure it'll wear off and I will be back in the next day. Zimmerman would have preferred to take a long weekend at a spa and try to clear her mind, but she had too much to do, what with secession and normal business. Now it is time for our first surprise of the night. Susan Green has actually hijacked a slot, and she was supposed to be next to last, but she threatened me, and so now she will be going third. Susan is a former teacher of French and English. While working, she always looked forward to retirement so she could finally get down to writing the great American novel. Susan's last year of teaching was in 1998, so she seems to have gotten the teensiest bit off track in her quest. Nonetheless, she would like to share with you tonight a snippet or two from one of her endeavors, a collection of observations about what she, call, about what she calls the boomer bummer, i.e., that is, the nightmare and funny side of caring for a parent with Alzheimer's. Let's give her a round of applause. Good evening. Um, I have two little snippets to read to y'all tonight. One is um, the, the not so funny side of caring for a parent with Alzheimer's and then the other one is maybe a little funnier. I should tell you that um, my mother's name is Geraldine, sometimes called Jerry, and um, my father was Curtis. So this first one is called Pass the Remote and I'm putting on my glasses. 
I steered Lulu, my beloved little white prelude, to a lurching halt at the curb. I knew there'd be at least one of mother's neighbors tis tisking from behind their closed curtain. Hmm. Jerry's daughter again, always in such a hurry. I sighed right along with Lulu as she ticked into part silence. Well, yeah, that would probably be because I am in a hurry. Jerking the key from the ignition, I assumed on a mission mode, ejected from the driver's side, and scurried up the short sidewalk to the front door, <clears throat> hoping this would be a short, uncomplicated check-in. Upon trying the knob, I was exasperated to find it unlocked again, despite my many warnings to Geraldine. I stuffed the key in my purse, stepped inside, fighting the urge to yell out something like, hey, it's Jack the Ripper, thanking you kindly for leaving the door wide open. But I didn't say a word <clears throat> because I instantly felt an alarming silence in the house. Making a point to keep any shade of panic out of my voice, I said quietly, mama, nothing. A few quick steps brought me to the entrance of the office where, much to my relief, was Geraldine seated in her favorite recliner, trance-like. Man, you scared me. Didn't you hear? But I cut myself off, realizing that no words were finding register in the mind of my mother, at least not in this moment. Standing just outside her periphery, I allowed myself to silently observe the statue before me. Absolutely still, except for the almost imperceptible but reassuring rise and fall of her chest, Geraldine's fully open eyes were seeing none of the pleasant view just beyond the bay window. I shuddered to imagine what she could possibly be contemplating. An incessant march of incomplete thoughts as though some sadist in her head kept clicking the remote before she could fully take in the picture on her mind's screen. Click. Curtis, laughing, grabbing her hand as they both turned their backs to the next onslaught of waves in the surf at Perdido. A momentary wistful smile. Click. Ladies, bridge luncheon. Now, who, who are these women? Lips pursed in concentration. Click. Scotch bottle, empty. Need to get to liquor store. Now, how to get there? A furrowing of the brow. Click. Today, my schedule is, well, I have to, ah, uh, blank. Click. Where are my friends? Who are my friends? Tear on cheek. Click. Empty. Click. Fear. Click. Nothing. Click. I shrunk back from the doorway, feeling as though I had intruded onto something intensely private. I tiptoed back to the door, opened and quickly shut it, this time with a resounding slam. Then, loudly, hey, Geraldine, where are you? After a brief moment of silence came a muffled, is that you, honey? Whew, I must have dozed off. Relief washed over me. Okay, she's back. Okay, that's the first one. <clears throat> this one is not so, not so funny. Okay, and this one is entitled, um, The Last Gene to Go. Swoosh, tick. Swoosh, tick. The extended exhale followed by the sudden single intake of the IV provided an insistent and monotonous reminder of my present location. My eyes wandered to the mounted TV to see that the next dose of titillating entertainment would be Jeremiah Johnson. Yet another movie I'd seen a dozen times, but at least this one had major eye candy. I hit the mute button on the clunky remote, allowing Jeremiah to simply mouth his precious few lines of dialogue. I tried again unsuccessfully to shift to a comfortable position, flinging my legs over the skinny wooden armrest. With its straight back and unnatural fabric, the chair's seemingly sole intent was to discourage visitors from staying too long. And yet, there I was. Turning from the TV, <clears throat> my, my gaze rested upon the hospital bed where Geraldine lay, apparently out of imminent danger now, and resting peacefully, except for the occasional undecipherable mumblings and mutterings. 
Even without the drugs coursing through her veins, Geraldine's conversations, increasingly hijacked these days by the big A, were a challenge. Except for being wheeled out of the room for this test or that procedure, she'd lain in the bed for what was approaching day three. All we can really do is just wait and see what the blood clot is going to do, the doctor had said. <clears throat> Yet another weekend of fun bites the dust, I thought, as I contemplated the, what was it, third, fourth event I'd had to back out of at the last minute. Nothing else to do, of course. No way could I have lived with myself if I'd flitted off somewhere and Geraldine had died alone in a hospital. Not that she would have known, but I would have. And so here I was again, seemingly needlessly, but at least avoiding even further guilt. Huh? Did you say something? I could have sworn a few syllables belonging to the English language had escaped Geraldine's lips, but no further sound was forthcoming. I settled back into position number umpteen, scrunching my arm between rib cage and chair back, my hand squeezing up at an impossible angle to hold my book. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Robert Redford's face fill the entire TV screen again. I allowed myself to gawk a moment, sighed, and then turned to concentrate on the page, trying to forget where I was. A soft-shoed nurse whisked in and out to check the IV. The patient across the hall erupted into a coughing spasm. Machines dinged and beeped. Along the corridor, an orderly whisked the evening meals, their unmistakable hospital food aroma wafting in the wake. Eventually, though, all distractions reduced themselves to a blessed cloister of white noise. And then, suddenly, from the bed came Geraldine's voice, her voice of a good 10 years earlier, strong, clear, confident. Now that is one fine looking young stud. <laughs> Swiveling around, I couldn't believe what I'd just heard. I quickly untangled myself from the chair and pressed myself against the bed, eyes riveted onto Geraldine's face. Her eyes were barely open and her expression betrayed none of the hot mama observations she'd just uttered. I waited, hoping for more, but there was to be no further comment. I felt my earlier sense of exasperation dissipating rapidly. A smile crept across my face as I figured I'd just been lucky enough to witness what was perhaps the swan song of the last gene to go. Damn straight, Geraldine, you still know a hunk when you see one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next reader tonight is Sean Armand, who is a fellow employee here at the Hoover Public Library, and his writing is predominantly comedic, comedic with a focus on dialogue. His piece, Karis Runs, was recently published in the current issue of the Birmingham Arts Journal. And we are also in for a treat because one of his pieces that he will be performing tonight includes a special guest star, so you don't get to see that every day in a reading. So let's hear it for Sean. Give a quick hand to Anthony for holding Right Club together. What is this, like our sixth year or something? <laughs> I always look forward to flash fiction night. Um, I'm going to bring my, uh, my special guest, Annabeth, from the kids department. She's graciously agreed to read my first piece uh, like as of about 20 minutes prior to this performance starting. Um, after that, I'm going to read Karis Runs On, which is a 678-word sentence. So <laughs> But before that, we have a dramatic interpretation. You sent for me, Your Majesty. I did, Lord Moulton. Thank you for such a prompt re response. How could I resist being Her Majesty's first audience? An honor, indeed. Quite. It was a lovely coronation, the finest since Queen Augustina herself. Your seventh, I believe. Sadly, yes. I never fully expressed my condolences for your father. He was a wise man. That he was. Unfortunately, someone was wiser. The royal family has many enemies. Lord Moulton, may I confide in you? Of course. I'm frightened. 
Well, even royal blood is prone to humanity, although it should never be observed in the courtyard. Agreed. I'm considering appointing a liaison to make appearances in my place. Well, far be it from me to question Her Majesty's decrees. I did not summon you here for you to hold your tongue. I'm aware you believe me inexperienced and unfit to rule, and in the shadow of my father's passing, I feel the true weight of your words. So my counsel, then. Would you care for a glass of wine, Lord Moulton? Uh, allow me, Your Majesty. <laughs> no, I insist. My father used to say all great journeys begin with a glass of wine. Uh, the Gentle Rose is one of the finest blends in the known world, and it's sponsored by Nestle, apparently. <laughs> a perfect beginning. The bottle is a gift, one I've been apprehensive to open. As you should, Your Majesty, but that particular bottle is a 1238 vintage, which I can personally vouch for. I have one in my case at home. Lord Moulton, as, la as late as six months ago, your opinion of me has was untethered. You thought me whimsical, and what was it? Uh, naive, yes, a lovely trait for a child, but those who sit on the throne must be willing to do terrible things. Innocence is the first of many sacrifices. But when my father was killed, your opinion changed? I withheld my opinion, out of respect. You also became very supportive of my reign. One might question such a change in stance. The wake of tragedy reveals much about a person's character, even to oneself. Occasionally, one such as yourself grows into the crown, and far be it from me to stand in the way. And what think you of me now? Still naive? You're very young, idealistic. Your father's assassin has been apprehended, and you still allow him to draw breath in his prison. I have unanswered questions. Answers are often the second sacrifice. The crown calls to action. And that call is mine alone. Two unanswered questions, then. Lord Moulton, what would you do were you in my position? I drink from my goblet. The gentle rose is quite divine. The man in jail, he maintains his innocence. Of course he does. People lie, especially to the crown. It's a game, Your Majesty. Your longevity depends on your skill and how quickly you learn to play. Games are not something I find myself aligned with. Then I suggest you find someone who is and appoint that man to be your royal liaison. That man? Someone such as yourself, Lord Moulton? I would. It's best for everyone. There's no shame. Why not in ten days you make your appointment? I could open my bottle of 1238 Gentle Rose, and we can raise a glass of wine to a great journey together. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Lord Moulton. This is your bottle of 1238 Gentle Rose. I see. I was saving this for you. I've misjudged you. A pity, really. Perhaps my approach was a miscalculation. An alliance between us could have never lasted. I suppose not. <laughs> what a wonderful short journey it could have been. Will you still be looking for a liaison, then? No, I feel I might grow quite fond of my speaking appearances. Well, I respectfully retract my previous comments, Your Majesty. You're ready, and the throne will suit you. Please know that your words are gratefully received. I'll not forget them. Well, if you're not going to drink yours, there's no sense in wasting the vintage. Indeed. To your longevity, my queen. And to your memory. <laughs> Thank you. There was a crisp autumn webbing in the morning air, uncharacteristic of late July, which it was, as I laced up my newly broken-in sneakers snugly around my carefully trained dancers' feet, which were graceful under the pressure of an audience's evaluation, but terribly inconsistent of balance otherwise, and began my unbridled horizontal free fall through the doorway, across the sidewalk, and on to the familiar pavement which soon dissolved into the streets of strangers with a stride in my footsteps, tapping out the rhythm of a veteran percussionist granting the less experienced house instrumentalists a foundation on which to play and explore, and the earliest of unfortunate risers wearily greeted me with a silent wave and a melancholy attached to the 
where was I? Attached to the knowledge of what undeserved stressors awaited them at the end of their vehicle's journey across the interstate, and the odd feline, who had undoubtedly claimed a better portion of the neighboring blocks as its area of dominance, took little more than a passing interest in my approach when I became aware that a motorized delivery service vehicle containing one driver and one passenger both of whom were being guided by the presumption that their current assignment to distribute the weekly collection of coupon-laden advertisements to anonymous recipients devoid of incentive to peruse through said plastic blanketed media was better suited for an employee of comparatively less advanced qualification and age than they were, had begun keeping pace with my shoe sole's measurable contact tapping against the granite below me for reasons I'm better off not taking into speculation, but in the event that the discussion should arise in my absence, I'm obliged in expressing that my choice of attire is selected from my own comfort and delight and factors in no other assessment from any outside source. And individual packages of the aforementioned literary product in possession of said transport was serving its couriers as what I can only assume to be an entertaining projectile with my variable personal space and the lone patron of kinetic medication con contained therein as the intended target for a series of aerial ammunition, all bearing the 50 cent off half a dozen 60 watt light bulbs emblem, was marking the pathway I found myself on and their aim was becoming progressively less humorous, at least in the eyes of the soul attached to the heels and the scope, and it's with a certain amount of empathic regret I consider the pitiable gentleman tasked with restocking the vendor's wagon of morning-related produce, i.e. apples, strawberries, variously flavored and colored juice, reminiscent liquids in single-serving containers, on top of a pile of what can only be described as a previously existing glacier's worth of ice separated into its individual components for the purpose of temperature regulation, with which the middle-aged man, with whom I was soon to nearly have an encounter, was engaged in refilling his wagon for a stray paper ballista meant for an area of my anatomy somewhere between my waistline and toes wound up ricocheting off the metallic waist receptacle, impacting his wrist instead, dislodging the utensil he was using to scoop the ice into the wooden cart and spilling it into the sidewalk where a hapless pedestrian, being preoccupied with his handheld device, reacted on reflex to the sudden lack of friction where his soles no longer held traction and tore off the side of the wagon on his way down while trying to regain his balance, sending the contents previ previously held within into the street and the path of my pursuers, diverting their vehicle's tires into the side of a nearby station wagon, which happened to be parked in the wrong spot in as much as fate was concerned, leaving me with a sense of satisfaction that I truly should be ashamed of, on par with the knowledge that I didn't stop to pretend like I didn't know what had transpired, but my morning jog is a sacred experience to me, and no buffoons with licenses will keep me from it, so I just kept running on. <laughs> All right. Our next reader tonight will be Angela Thomas. Now, Angela is a resident of South Side of Birmingham, and during the day, and probably nights too, she's a caregiver. And at night, and probably at day for that matter, she is a poet. She has been published in such periodicals as The Guzzler, and was awarded an honorable mention from the world of poetry. So, without no further ado, let's welcome Angela Stage. This is a poem that I wrote shortly after I was emotionally ambushed. And the title of it is Blinded by Lies Disguised as True Love. And I hope you all enjoy it. I picked you up in my pretty small car that day when you came into my life. And after only a few days of spending time with you, eating with you, I thought, no. Not later, but yes, much sooner, one day, I could be your wife, visually appealing, a tall, dark specimen of a man you were then, spiritually grounded, family-oriented, this well-traveled intellect, I thought, could share with me many places never before have I been. Despite unacceptable torment from another race while growing up as a kid, periodic incarceration during your teenage years, 
Plus, as an adult with a constant flow of so many women that you loved and left behind, how foolish of me back then thinking you were really such a great find. But I was truly blindsided because all along you should not, I should not have claimed you because you definitely were not mine. Had I known early on when we first kissed, then you laid your lips on me. A recipe for disaster, that poison, that toxic mix, you gave and placed it on me. Even while we engaged in and enjoyed each other's company at beautiful destinations, not too far from home, too many late night text messages and so many calls came in constantly, so freely on your phone. They were from your women, you know, the ones who refused to leave you alone. And then what was truly revealed to me while, we were while you were recovering from a sickness, oh yes, the one that you know all too well. And based on your ugly reactions from the facts to you I had to tell, to me was constant, concrete confirmation our seemingly perfect union as husband and wife was not one of divine intervention, but yes, one instead delivered straight from hell. How dare you manipulate me, play me, use me, accuse me for the twisted enjoyment for your sick soul? And as discussed many times with you, a marriage without trust will result in failure from others. How true. This for sure I have been told. I really cared for you and I trusted you but the show of appreciation from you, so cold, so heartless. But that's okay. My true faith I can rely on to help heal me, then pull me up out of this darkness. Well, life goes on. Despite this temporary mess created by you, so right now peace is what I seek. And thanks to words of encouragement and positive influences, Overall, your ruthless companion one day, I'm sure you'll meet. Why didn't I proceed with caution when I first met you? Well, I'll admit, I was lonely and looking for true love. And from you, wow, I knew it was overdue. My heart is deeply scarred from this. I've learned from this. I must do the exact opposite of this. As God is my witness, this is my wish. And even though... I was really blinded by all of your lies disguised as true love. They will be obtained again. Kindness, peace, joy, happiness, and real love. But only from the creator, you know, the one who sits high, looks down, takes notes, and observes from above. Our next presenter tonight will be Chuck Allen. Now Chuck uses stories to remind himself and others of the important things in life. His works include both fiction and nonfiction, ranging from heartfelt love stories to humorous discussions of family or marriage. He and his wife, along with their three children, live in West Blockton, Alabama. So let's give a warm round of applause for Chuck. I'll be reading a piece titled, Missing Jordan. <clears throat> I've always been leery of stray dogs. I mean, they might have diseases like rabies or mange. And on top of that, you never know when someone might show up and claim them. But when I saw Caleb playing with this dog, I didn't have the heart to object. It was the first time in months I had heard him really laugh. Sure, he had giggled and chuckled a bit, but Caleb has a laughter that can fill an entire house. Caleb's laugh usually captures everyone around, forcing at least a smile from even the most stoic individuals. And on this day, that laugh was back. It was our first real attempt at a family outing in well over a year. Granted, we were only 30 minutes from the house having a picnic at the park by the lake, 
but it was an intentional change from days spent at the hospital or sitting around the house. I wasn't so sure about the idea, but Lynn insisted that we do something. It'll be good for all of us, she said. At the moment, I was sitting in a lawn chair, staring at the lake. Lynn was lying on a blanket, reading a book. I couldn't make myself read anymore. In fact, there were very few things I found interesting these days. The images of Jordan lying in that hospital bed and later in that casket had left me feeling numb. When Jordan, when Jordan first began chemotherapy, I was optimistic, certain that he would get better. The doctors had hinted there was a long shot, but I convinced myself that Jordan would survive. I didn't give up my hope until I watched them disconnect the tubes and turn off the machines and leave his lifeless body lying there in silence. But for some reason, I couldn't cry. Perhaps I felt I needed to be strong. Lynn cried nonstop for days. Caleb, at six years old, was obviously confused. Someone had to take care of the details. The next several days were filled with arrangements, as well as visits from family and friends. The weeks after that had been the hardest, as, we, as life tried to resume some semblance of normalcy. I started back to work. Caleb went back to school. Lynn cried less after a while. But life would never be normal again. It felt like a part of our family had been ripped from us, leaving a gaping wound. And if wounds can bind people together, then perhaps that's what bound me to this dog. Watching him and Caleb chase each other around the park, I noticed his strange gait. When they stopped, the reason became obvious. The dog only had three legs. Where his fourth leg had been was a noticeable wound that had long since healed. But this didn't slow him down. He chased Caleb from the lakeshore to the restrooms back over and over again. I couldn't help but smile watching them wrestle in the grass, Caleb laughing with the joy that accompanies a new friendship. I must have closed my eyes for a bit because I was startled when Caleb climbed into my lap. We're tired, Daddy, he said as he leaned his head on my shoulder. He smelled like a little boy who'd been running and playing. I rubbed the back of his head to help him drift off to sleep, but was interrupted by the dog climbing into my lap as well. Now, I'm not much of an animal person. I was about to brush him away when I noticed that he laid his head on Caleb's back. Caleb looked up at me with a big smile on his face. This is Frankie. He's my friend. With that, he put his head back down to rest. By this time, Lynn had put her book down and was sleeping. So here I sat in a lawn chair holding my son with a medium-sized dog sitting in front of me with one paw on, his, on my leg and his head on Caleb's back. I cried. I guess I realized what I had known all along. Life would never be the same, but it would go on. Missing Jordan was now a part of my life. Our family would heal, but Jordan's absence would be there forever. Our next reader is Christopher Michael Suda. Christopher is a Michigan native who now lives in Birmingham, Alabama. Chris is also a musician involved in three active projects here in Birmingham, In Snow, Love is Light, and Follow Us More. Aside from music, he is also a poet who has been published in Fractal Magazine, Jonah Magazine, and The Outsiders Review, among also many other periodicals. So let's give a warm round of applause for Chris. Hello, everybody. Uh, usually, uh, last year, I read poetry, but this time, I've been writing a fiction piece uh, for over the past couple of years. Um, and I suppose the better place to start is the beginning of it. And it's something I've <clears throat> been working on, you know, uh, on and off. You know how things are with writing. You get excited, then you don't care. You get excited, you don't care. And then you really like it, and then, you know, the repeating thing. So, yeah, so this is called Gnosis. That's uh, translated into English as knowledge. So this is a somewhat exploration, exploration of that. <laughs> Cynthia Rowe claimed she never had a childhood, but no one had ever believed her. Everyone's had a childhood. Perhaps hers had been one of those finely tuned examples of all heaven gone wrong, but that doesn't mean it just didn't happen. Sometimes I still wish Cynthia would figure out a proper way to only say what was going on in her mind. It's not that hard to do. 
At 26 years, I've been the only one responsible for her, for the past eight of them at least. Dad and Mom had died long, died long ago before she had made any real progress in the matter. And I didn't want a stranger looking after her day and night, so I just took care of her. Of course, there had been doctors down the road, psychologists and whatever have you, that have tried to figure her out, but it never worked. They all kept asking the wrong questions, or perhaps I decided to leave all the better ones in their lavishly shaped heads, perhaps, so they wouldn't come off as unprofessional. But that's only my opinion, a brotherly hindsight and foresight, if you will. For example, here's Cynthia with her first therapist, a mere two weeks into her sessions. Psychologist one. Cynthia Rowe, your name is, your name is Cynthia Rowe, yes? Yes, ma'am, sure is. What's yours? Uh, I thought we went over, yes, we have, Cynthia. You should know my name by now. Would you tell me my name, please, wouldn't you? But I like the way you say it. Just one more time, please. It's Dr. Wyatt. Dr. Samantha Wyatt. That's it. That's your name. Sorry. Sorry, Dr. Wyatt. Lately, I've been having a case of what a fair amount of geniuses call memory loss. I can't recall if it's long, short term, but if I had to guess, I wouldn't feel too good about getting the answer wrong, so I probably should just go ahead and find another way to go about it, other than guessing. You know. What would you suggest, Dr. Wyatt? Let's not worry so much about that right now, Cynthia. Let's move on to what's really the matter with all of this, the matter of your childhood. What childhood? Here I am looking for answers, and you just want to move on. Cynthia, that's, I, didn't, I didn't mean, can you not see what's happening here? I don't understand. Let's start, let's start at the beginning. There is no beginning. We have reached the end. Now let us approach the idea of my beginning. And just so we don't get off subject yet again, what is happening here is avoidance, classical avoidance. You should know that. I'm sure you do know that. Nothing easier to spot than a clear-cut hack. I'm sure you know that too. Doctor, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. You caught me on a bad one, but... Okay, you want childhood? Pull an extra wise file out of that cabinet beside you and begin reading. The story never changes, no matter which one you grab. Go ahead, grab one, pretend it's me, start fixing the problem, start fixing your problem. I don't need this. Okay, and that's one of my many examples of Cynthia's portrayal in the office. I hated whenever she had done this to me, especially when I had to watch those poor women and that one man walk out of their own offices, holding back their half sobs after they couldn't hold any of it back any longer. I would go ahead and bet some of them had wished their own files had been in those cabinets so they could at least attempt to do what they were paid to do for Cynthia on themselves. Cynthia was cunning, stubborn, obviously, for everyone that tried to work with her. And the worst part about it was that she had known this all her life. It, always been, it had always been a rather modest yet eager task for Cynthia to go ahead and take a uh, sort of advantage over another person's self-oriented display of power. I will admit that I have at times enjoyed how she could throw the switch so perfectly during some of those sessions, though. She had this special gift which others were usually too afraid to show off in the everyday world. As the sessions went on, I realized that I only wanted for one thing to happen, for all these sessions to end. After three years of therapy in Braintree, Massachusetts, Woodstock, New York, and the various other offices around the southern ridges of New Jersey, that I could decently afford, it had become more and more difficult to get her to seek out alternative therapies. One would think that her ability to take over with ease the positions of power in all of those rooms would be a good enough reason to discontinue, but it hadn't been. But let us be clear, she had never enjoyed herself in, in any of these sessions. She reviled herself during each and every one of them. Now, I believe she's got better because she told the truth in all of those rooms, and the truth for Cynthia was a type of pill a sort of antidote that would sneak up on her when she hadn't been ready for it, but nevertheless had to let it expose itself in its own time. It was this species of medicine that kept her neurons alive. It made her talk, not about her feelings at that instance, but rather what she had been felt about having feelings that caused the truth to tongue its long way out. Now, this is her truth, mind you. In those rooms were all of the accomplishments of an esteemed, well-affiliated physician decorated all the walls, this had been the only place where she could exhale her one chieftain of all the anxieties in her own world, the universal frustration of having been placed in a world without her having a say in the matter. Now, Cynthia wasn't suicidal. I say this because the time when she had come out of her room, or our room, we shared a single bedroom for the past three years, she can't stand being alone, and she said this, I just don't believe in it. Suicide, you know. After adjusting the dog-eared pages of the pocket-sized thesaurus that she always kept on her, she continued, but don't view me as just one of those who walks around with a gavel in their hand either. 
I just don't believe it provides that sense of satisfaction that people think they get after they have committed the act itself is all. She usually began these dissertations whenever she felt the moment had been right for them. <clears throat> then again, I cannot remember a particular singular moment when the time hadn't been that absolute textbook moment for Cynthia. Being her brother has allowed me the satisfaction of growing used to such things, so it has never bothered me that much. Maybe the real reason for this had been because of the way she always spoke to me, with authenticity. But again, this is probably only my subjective gaze on the matter. When she had finally crept out from underneath the door frame of her room and headed towards me as I fiddled with my newspaper, I knew I was in the mood for anything else except what was between my fingertips. Then again, who was ever in the mood for that kind of subject? It's too close to everyone, everywhere. She did this on more than one occasion. It was rather routine in all honesty. She always entered my room, that is whatever room I may have been occupying at that particular moment, with a slow, pensive walk, which she had seemed to repair ahead of the time and then would appear to draw a steady line with her eyes so as to meet on the very ridges of mine. This is how it always was. But what had made this time unique was how she had stopped midway between the hallway, leading away from our room and the bar stool that I was perched on at the kitchen counter. As always, I finished the line I was reading, looked over to connect my stare with hers, and waited for her to preach her own gospel. But she didn't. She just stood there as if she had just been thrown into a shallow corner of her own brain until that corner became the reality she saw. And the reality where we were at, the only one that we can admit to know, the one in our apartment, had become only some faint shadow of what actually had been going on the whole time. Then the moment passed. I opened my mouth and without having, without having to look up said, it won't work on me like it does the soothsayer synth. Just let me read my paper, just let me read my paper. Out of my peripherals I noticed her readjust the page's corners those same pages she had just corrected back into their original, pristine form, and then begun to drift back towards the room she had started from. If she had been standing a little farther away before she had gone back down the hallway, I wouldn't have even noticed her walk away. She had a method of, she had a method of dodging all the spots where the floor was known to creak, to snap. She had always been courteous in my moods, and I couldn't stand it anymore. Idleness dominates will at certain positions in all of our lives when it is not to be expected. The act itself is not in any way peaceful, as some would like to imagine, or in a proud moment suggest. Rather, it was like all the pieces of a storm that hadn't hurried along fast enough as to suit one's taste. Weeks of rain, no thunder, while some weatherman inside your head keeps saying, here it comes, here it comes, any moment, and then it will flood, and it will flood, and it will flood, but then nothing. Anxiety built on frames without real walls. And then idleness grows another inch, and then by a mile, and then another inch, and then a mile, until you forget all about it. A storm that's no storm at all, and when rain comes, no one notices a damn thing. But it isn't their fault. They, are, they have already had one storm stored within themselves that has always been much more harmful than any grain of lightning in the sky, thunder in the air. This is what idleness can do, and damn, it does it well. The story I'm about to read is an exercise, an attempt on my part to capture a singular and solitary experience and amplify it with galvanizing language in the humble hope that my effort resembles a reverie, or at least feels a little like Zen. My intent with this introduction is not to explain my story's meaning, but instead to encourage you, encourage you to chew over this as an afterthought. A person's reasons for doing what she will do with herself, be it her heart, body, or mind, always belongs to her first and foremost. In a perfect world, it would only belong to that person. And when some outsider decides to put their spin on an act, apply their social standards or their societal expectations, no matter whether they bleat for yesterday's definition of decency or if they take up the herald howl of the freedom fighter, they are still guilty of committing a theft. You may soon think that my subject, too inconsequential to warrant all my this, preemptor, this preemptory sermonizing, and maybe this exercise face plants before the finish line of its intended goal, which is to record with a static language and act lovely in its own simplicity. 
one that belongs solely to that person and for that person's reasons alone. So let us all try to understand that no one deserves our disgust for whatever strides they take to make their own life a happy one, and no one deserves to be quantified into a statistic, no matter how progressive or noble the cause. No person is the master of another person's universe. As Voltaire admonished in Candide, tend your own garden. Her with the envious hair. And they really were such lovely curls, nesting about her face in licks of burnt brown, helixing down the back of her neck in sinuous spirals. This labyrinth of tresses responded to light by unearthing the precious metal hues of gold and copper. No matter if the source came from the sun's brush stroke up above or from the tepid fluorescence of a bathroom light bulb. Not that this affected the cool scrutiny with which she studied her mane in the mirror, weighing locks within the palm of either hand with the impassivity of a balance scale. She entwined curlicues of brown around one finger at random and then let the strands twirl back like a spring to their natural state of graceful buoyancy. She gave one last roving appraisal of her lush head of hair, her tongue firmly prodding the pocket of a cheek, loose tiles groaning underfoot as she shifted from profile to profile, and then reached for a pair of long silver scissors awaiting atop the porcelain lip of the sink. There are experts who explain that suicides always fumble first with hesitant cuts. But if some voyeur, a peeping tom cloaked with muted wings and gloved with hairs that hook, were to swoop silently to some perch perfect for leering, a high seat on the wall, or the plastic clasp bookending an upper corner of the mirror, or maybe even the metal curve of the shower curtain rod, if this airfoiled sneak was slathering for her hand to swerve at the last second and snicker an ear by mistake, then what a bitter pill it must have been to see her snag four tendrils at once and take a bite through the meat of them with a singful, single tuneful snip, the curls plummeting to the blue and white tiles like flies poisoned in mid-flight. The bathroom floor staged a barber's ballet, a performance unobserved as she resolutely hewed the hair pillowing her angular features, working at a slant through the coils curtaining her ears. Clutching her bangs back into a quiff, like a scalp hunter intent on knifing free a trophy, she sheared loose her beautiful brown mop, raising backwards as if dismantling a headdress. She scissored and scissored until her shoulders were shed of its cowl of curls and her toes were jeweled with strings of severed strands. She let the scissors slide of a clatter into the sink and paused to admire her handiwork. Her skull was an erratic frump of cowlix, like the downy rump of a fledgling. She skimmed a hand across the surviving lockets. <clears throat> Sorry, she, yeah, she skimmed a hand across, and the surviving lockets tugged weakly in protest. She picked up the bumblebee-bodied electric razor from the shut lid of the toilet and adjusted the plastic guard muzzling the machine's mouth so that the metal teeth were at the shortest remove from her skin. She thumbed the battery power to life and leaned toward her reflection, the better to direct the stuttering blades. She mowed in wide swatches, scoring closer and closer to her scalp with each row. Positioning a paddle grip mirror to peer over her shoulder, she used this rear view vantage to steadily crop the round slope of her parietal and occipital bones. The razor went quiet mid-wine, leaving the phantom impression of its bumble in her inner ear. She closed her eyes and plumbed a pleasure garden of stubble with the pads of her fingers, surveying the landscape like a blind, carto like a blind cartographer massaging into memory a model for her mind to later map. The image of a puppy played through her thoughts, and she gave the fine brush carpeting its belly a deep and satisfying rub. Opening her eyes, she was greeted by a buzz-cut doppelganger wearing half a smile that pushed about the freckles ornamenting her chin. She noticed there was a slight mousy flap to her unperforated ears, more distinguishable now that her head resembled a face a few days in need of a shave. 
Taking a triangular tube from the upright atop the tank of the commode, she squeezed the blue paste onto her forehead, squirting a zigzag pattern along her pate like a child's finger painting of a mohawk. The cream felt icy and gelatinous atop her skull, a not unfamiliar feeling, and yet made strange by its current locale, as if it were a displaced sensation, a tickle on holiday. She lathered the cream until her skull was entirely caked beneath an aquamarine gleam, and then plucked up a fresh disposable razor from the sink rim. She retraced her previous swipes along her head, sliding the blades carefully along her skin and rinsing the razor clean beneath a steady chortle of hot water after every few inches. The process took even longer with the back of her head, the coordination between razor and part partnered mirrors resulting in several nicks that blew up blood from her skin like little bubbles of deep red glass. She surfed the smooth circumference of her dome, scouring for the stray prickle of a resilient bristle. She ducked her head past the purple shower curtain and doused her skull, her skull with the flush of cold water. She held herself beneath the numbing wash and tried to construct a melody out of the waterfall cackling in the basin of the tub below. She wrenched the flow of water off, laughing as she shivered, her cries breathless yet rapturous, the happy song of a seal. This fit nearly sent her topsy-turvy when her heels hit a slick of wet hair. Slipping and sliding for balance, she kicked the short-lived cloud of her discarded mane into the air, like an indignant party of pigeons pluming skyward, only to lower lamely the next instant in a mindless exchange of seats. She latched to the sink by its belly of both arms, bracing herself against the fall, her shoulders heaving with peals of hysterical laughter. She eased herself to her knees, then released the sink and lowered herself into a kowtow of full-body coughs. Slowly, she shivered her way to the comparable calm of 30 hiccups and giggles. As her heart rate and breathing untang untangled to resume their natural steady syncopation, she became increasingly aware of the loose rivulets running their divergent courses down the naked crest of her head, beating and dipping from newly bared angles. She rose before the mirror and watched the fingers of a familiar stranger explore something pale and newborn. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we will be having Nancy Dorman Hickson. Now, Nancy is originally from Mississippi, and um, she was a features editor with Progressive Farmer and Southern Living Magazine for many years, and now freelances as a writer for a magazine, magazine web and public relations client. She is the co-author of Diplomacy and Diamonds, the memoir of Joanne King Herring, the Texas woman who was portrayed by Julia Roberts in the movie Charlie Wilson's War. Tonight, Nancy is reading a piece from what she hopes will become a memoir. Let's hear it for Nancy. Thank you very much for waiting to the bitter end. <laughs> Punchline. We've never blended as families, so why start now with Dad's death? Instead, we divide the task involved for his funeral. My sisters Beth and Mary and I camp at Beth's home. In another neighborhood, Dad's wife, Linda, greets the townsfolk who naturally gravitate toward Dad's house to pay their respects. Mary and I are creating the funeral program for the church service the next day. I say, I wish we knew which scriptures he liked. My brother-in-law responds, I noticed his Bible in the car. Dad's car, the car where he died a couple of days before, is now parked in Beth's driveway where my brother-in-law towed it. By the time Sammy found Dad sitting in his car in the garage with the door wide open, the car battery was shot from having the engine run all day. We don't know if Dad had been returning or leaving when his heart, <coughs> excuse me, when his heart stopped. Dad had highlighted some passages in the King James Bible that had a cheap vinyl covering worn on the edges. Some of the tissue-thin pages were bent and crumpled. Come on, let's decide. We've got to finish, says Mary the type of woman that writer Anne Lamott describes as a clipboard person. My younger sister never li lives a day without a list. 
Even her list have lists. This is the way she copes with both the everyday and the forever, taking charge and taking names. I, on the other hand, would have preferred poring over each passage that my dad had noted, contemplating them all before deciding which might be the most appropriate for this final tribute. Daddy would have been of the same school as my younger sister, whom he adored. Get her done was often my dad's rallying cry. We had a note in the program explaining how these verses are some of his favorites from his Bible. Say, warn Bible, I instruct, asserting my role as the writer of the family. At the funeral before the service, the house divided merges in a back room at the church when we meet with the minister. When it's time to enter the sanctuary, Linda and her children and grandchildren troop in first, filling the first row and spilling over to the second. My sisters and I and our families follow, settling into the remaining reserved seating. I've heard Southerners go on and on about the proper way to hold a funeral service. The seating arrangement that ensues on the day of my dad's funeral is perhaps a mortifying breach of protocol, relegating as it does the daughters of my father's first marriage to the second tier of the church pews. Frankly, I don't care. The thing that matters to me is that we pay proper respect to the man we all loved. We each do pay tribute in our own way. Mary, who possesses Daddy's charm and magnetism, stands at the pulpit and tells the mourners a familiar story from his ragged rural childhood. In it, he, and now my sister, describes an unthinkable act executed by him toward a dog he professed to love. The story includes an equal mix of horror and humor, as most stories of the South do. While his parents are out of the house, this young version of my father decides he will bob the perfectly good tail of his pet. Fortunately, as told by Daddy, the dog, quote, got a notion of what I was up to, and just as I came down with the knife, he took off so that I only caught the tip of his tail. It's only a small portion, but it's enough to cover the kitchen in mayhem. At this point, it occurs to the child that perhaps this is not his finest hour. Like the dog, he disappears, sliding underneath the porch of their home. When his parents walk through the door, they stumble upon a bloody kitchen crime scene, complete with a wicked-looking discarded butcher knife. Worst of all, their young son is missing. Naturally, the law is called. From his hidey hole underneath the porch, my father listens to the tempest overhead that he has rocked. He hears one policeman tell another, I don't know who or what got that little bastard, but he sure put up one hell of a fight. <laughs> Daddy, and now Mary, ends the tale there because that is the punchline that should wrap up the story. But when my father was alive and well and laughing in the center of our lives and he told that story, I always clamored for more details. But what happened next, I'd badger. Did you get punished? How'd they find you? Daddy rolled his eyes at me, disgusted. How could he have raised a child who did not understand the essence of storytelling, the warp and wonder of the tale with a capital T? He reluctantly answered the pedestrian facts I craved, of the dog slinking into the kitchen with his barely maimed tail, of his father seeing the sorry state of the dog and rightly attributing the cause, of the search for the child's hiding place. Daddy honestly did not recall if he'd been punished for the crime against the dog and for causing a town-wide manhunt for a knife-wielding child murderer. The superfluous consequences added nothing to the story. At his funeral, my sister tells that story well, with just the right inflection and nuance and dramatic purchase to make the story sing. When we get home from the graveside service, my father's Bible is still on the coffee table. Take it, Mary says, handing it to me. But didn't Linda ask about it, I say? The good girl, always wanting to know all of the facts, even the ones that are inconvenient to the story. Yeah, she wants it, said Beth, my other sister, but you take it. I think it should stay with us. Hell, you're the only one who might read it. Thank you. Let's give everybody who read the night one last warm, warm round of applause.